uh, it's a great uh, uh, privilege to welcome you all to the uh, Cambridge New Testament Research Seminar from the 2nd of March. And today's seminar and next seminar are devoted to the Gospels as ancient biographies. Uh, and for that reason, also a special welcome for those who have listed their interest in this and have joined us for these two sessions. Uh, of course, uh, a very warm welcome to our guest, Professor Kasper Bro Larsen from Aarhus in Denmark, just across the North Sea in the northeastern direction from the coast here. And uh, Professor Bro Larsen is an expert on the literary context of the Gospel of John. His marvelous uh, thesis is even during lockdown. I have in my home office rather than in uh, the faculty office. Uh, his uh, thesis was on recognition in the Gospel of John, uh, basically affirming Alan Culpepper's literary turn in Johannine studies, uh, but following up on his general remarks on the importance of recognition in the Gospel of John with a detailed study how this works in an ancient literary context devoting ample attention to Homer and Aristotle's reflections in his poetics on the importance of recognition in Homer's Odyssey and applying them to the Gospel of Job. Professor uh, Bro Larson's literary interest in John is also visible in the volume that he edited on John and genre uh, under the title The Gospel of John as Genre Mosaic. We are very pleased to have him, if alas, only digitally, but not less realistically. So today he will be speaking on programmatic scenes in the New Testament Gospels and ancient biography. We very much look forward uh, to your paper and the digital floor is yours. Thank you very much, George. I've been looking very much forward to this uh, event uh, to be able to present to you uh, some ongoing research of mine. Uh, since I'm currently uh, working on a, vo a volume uh, with the title that you can see in front of you, Programmatic Scenes in New Testament Gospels and Ancient Biographies. Uh, it is a project that I have been trying to start on for a year or two, but uh, not never really got the time, but I was fortunate that uh, Carlsberg uh, sponsored one year's salary for me, uh, and that's why the, I put their name there. Uh, I can tell you in the Nordic countries, it's, 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 the, it's the dangerous liquids that sponsor uh, a scholarship within arts and theology. Uh, we have uh, the oil in Norway and Carlsberg in Denmark, and uh, we even have a poison factory sponsoring lots of research at my university, but please don't tell anyone. Uh, so uh, from, from, uh, from uh, the, the next term after summer, I will be able to work uh, in a concentrated manner on this project. So, so what I'm presenting to you today is uh, in some ways uh, premature uh, because uh, I have not written this uh, yet. I'm uh, researching it currently, and uh, what I want to present to you is a is a florilegium uh, of uh, of ideas uh, that I I don't really know always if I'm I will be able to uh, realize uh, in that uh, volume. But uh, as you heard from uh, George, uh, I have I have an interest in. Uh, in genres and the gospels in their ancient literary context. Um, and uh, I have been told by George that I, I have uh, between 45 to 60 minutes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll keep that uh, and we can have the discussion afterwards. Uh, but I have an interest in uh, genres and uh, gospel literature and um, is see in many ways the gospels as uh, genre mosaics. So that doesn't e does not only apply to the gospel of John, but uh, to the early gospels that they are uh, mosaics in the sense that they can be viewed from a generic point uh, from, uh, from a distance, looking at the work as a whole, but they can also be viewed uh, up close uh, looking at the individual tiles that make up uh, the mosaic as a whole. 
So the generic question is interesting, both in relation to the work as a whole, uh, gospels in relation to biographies, for example, but also when we uh, zoom into the, the uh, individual uh, pericopes, uh, how they relate to general literary forms in antiquity. And as uh, George mentioned, uh, one uh, such literary form is the recognition scene, uh, anagnorisis. Uh, another one that I have, I'm researching now is the programmatic scene. And uh, the programmatic scene, well, it very much relates uh, to the whole question of how to begin a work. It's a, it's a very fascinating topic to me, uh, the beginnings of works, uh, how both in modern and, and ancient uh, literature. Uh, I, I once met a best-selling Danish author who told me that, that in his novels, he wanted the first uh, page to contain the whole novel. And then he continued, he wanted the first line to contain the whole novel. And he continued and said he wanted the first word to contain the whole novel. So uh, he was very ambitious uh, in terms of how to begin a literary work. And uh, of course, there are lots of uh, modern literary theory on that, but also the ancients uh, discussed how to begin a work uh, in rhetoric, for example, uh, the exordium uh, uh, or the preumium is important to, to uh, not only uh, present the main topics uh, of the speech, but also to establish the, uh, the ethos of the speaker uh, from the very beginning. And also, uh, also in, uh, in, in the poetics of Aristotle, uh, he speaks of the beginning, middle and end of a of a plot, of a mythos, and the beginning uh, has, must not be arbitrary. It's so important, uh, he says, uh, that the, the, the beginning is not an arbitrary point. And uh, where, what I mean by a programmatic scene is uh, how gospels begin, but, not, but I'm not thinking of the first lines in the gospels. I'm, I'm, th I'm thinking of the main, as I write here, the main character's first public programmatic appearance. And that can be uh, in, in, liter in ancient literature, it can be the first speech, the first uh, discourse, uh, the first military campaign, uh, things like that. So uh, the programmatic scene is, is it's, uh, it's uh, my, my term. It's an ethic genre category. Um, I would, of course, have loved if I would have been able to find the name for this kind of scene in ancient literary theory or rhetoric, uh, the first public uh, programmatic appearance. And I would uh, love if, if, if you would uh, be able to help me in, in specific directions. But I have not been able to find an equivalent in, in the rhetoric and, and in rhetoric and programmatic and and places like that. So so this is an uh, ethic genre uh, category. Uh, unlike, for example, uh, anagnorisis, which was uh, defined as a, a genre in antiquity. Um, that that may, in some sense, be a problem. In another sense, not because, I mean, most of the genre designations that we work with uh, when we study ancient texts maybe I'm exaggerating now, but many of them are ethic genre categories, like, uh, for example, the novel, the ancient novel. Nobody was talking about the novel in antiquity. Uh, in, in gospel research, we have the miracle the narratives. We have, we have, uh, we have ap apocalypses in biblical studies. And uh, those are all uh, ethic genre categories, meaning that those are uh, categories created by scholars who uh, have seen a kind of pattern in ancient texts that, that uh, was not formulated by the ancients. But, uh, but I, I think we can, we, we can work in that way. Um, at least that's 
how we seem to do with other genre categories. So my hope is that uh, I can I can sell this uh, idea to other scholars. So programmatic scene will become something that we will use in the study of New Testament gospels because I think it's an important uh, feature in those texts. And uh, my working hypotheses uh, are that that uh, the programmatic scene, uh, the first public programmatic appearance of the main character is a common device in ancient biographies. We can find it uh, uh, in many biographies, not in all, but in many, and uh, that it has some, some general common traits, though I am not able to, to identify a specific, um, a specific set of moves in the in the scene. The scene can be very differently uh, articulated, uh, long and or short. Uh, but in general, it is it is a common device in ancient biographies. It serves to prime the reader uh, by presenting a full image of the main character from the very beginning. So the first public uh, appearance is of course not arbitrary. It is programmatic in the sense that it it is uh, a kind of synecdochical miniature of the work as a whole. Uh, it also works good in, a, in an oral culture where you, you need to say the most important things first uh, bef to be sure that the audience gets it. So uh, the programmatic scene is an interpretive key to the literary work in which it appears. It is a kind of window into the whole work. Um, in New Testament studies, uh, this is, it's not a new thing to talk about a programmatic scene, because uh, it, I would rather say that it's a, a standard uh, interpretation of Luke 4, 16 to 30. Jesus' uh, first inaugural speech in uh, the synagogue in Nazareth has often been described as programmatic. Uh, Rudolf Bultmann did that. He calls it ein programmatischer Antritt. Fitzmaier, in his famous uh, Anchor Bible commentary, talks about a programmatic purpose. purpose. Uh, uh, Alfred Strobel, I think it's Alfred, uh, talks about an Antrittspredigt inaugural sermon. And uh, Ulrich Busse talks about the, the Nazareth Manifesto. So there are many ways of describing that scene as programmatic. But my claim here is that this is not only a Lucan feature, but it is uh, something that we find in, in all New Testament gospels and that it may be uh, uh, inspired by, by uh, this, uh, this, uh, this micro genre uh, appearing mainly in biographies just as other features in the Gospels, uh, like the Ultima Verba uh, of Jesus, is a rather common feature in ancient biographies that uh, also signals uh, uh, the, 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 the identity of, of the main character. So, um, when uh, when when realizing that uh, Luke has a programmatic scene, um, my, my, my first question was uh, to whether this is, is something from the, from the Hebrew Bible uh, narrative tradition. Um, and I, I, I know that there, are, there is among, in the prophetic literature, uh, an idea of a call narrative. A call narrative where the prophet is uh, appointed by God uh, and I was wondering in my look at, uh, at the Hebrew Bible, uh, whether there would be also a kind of a type scene after the call narrative, where the prophet uh, stands on the public uh, scene for the first time. It was difficult for me to find that as a, a consistent uh, feature, but still I would say that we might find scenes in the he Hebrew Bible that could also uh, work in the same way as the programmatic scenes in the Gospels. And I brought uh, a, co a couple of examples uh, with me uh, from the book of, of Joshua. Joshua would, of course, be the main character. And the first two chapters uh, are pre preparatory chap 
chapters about his uh, calling and his uh, his preparation be before the the conquest of the of the land of milk and honey um and after these two pre preparatory uh, chapters we have the crossing of jo of jordan the river jordan in chapter three uh, which could be seen as a kind of programmatic scene, that is Joshua's first public uh, action. That is also, uh, which is programmatic in the sense that it's, it signals what the whole book of Joshua is about, the conquering of, uh, of, the, of the promised land. Um, but there is nothing about the background of Joshua in that book. So here we would have a kind of a, the, the Markan way of doing it. Uh, first, Samuel is more Matthean or Lucan, if I may so, in the sense that that here we have some uh, a, a, a the the what, what, some uh, um, a kind of potential biography uh, of Samuel, and we and we get the. We, we get the story about his birth and his calling uh, in the first chapters uh, one to three uh, as a child. Uh, and then four to seven are chapters that tell the story about how the Ark is captured by the Philistines and return. And that, that, that story uh, moves into, uh, oh, sorry, into chapter uh, seven, where Samuel for the first time appears as prophet and judge in public and says, uh, as I have on the quotation here, if you are returning to the Lord uh, with all your heart, then you put away the foreign gods uh, and the Astartes from among you, direct your heart uh, to the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the land of the Philistines. So, uh, and that is the same message we have in 28 in the end of this uh, first Samuel uh, writing. So, that is a very programmatic statement uh, of Samuel's in his first public appearance. Uh, turn to the Lord and he will protect you. Uh, uh, turn away and uh, the, uh, the, the land and the people will, uh, will uh, be in calamities. So uh, I'm not uh, trying to say that programmatic scenes are only there in the Greco-Roman biographies. Uh, we could see uh, similar ways of presenting the main character's entry uh, in, in the Hebrew Bible. But uh, what, what I have a prim primary interest in is to look at how they work in the BI or, or the Vitae. And uh, there are some, uh, some common traits uh, uh, in them, but let me first mention a couple of examples for you. Uh, first, uh, there is uh, the biography about uh, the Th Themistocles, uh, one of the uh, Athenian politicians in the fifth uh, or sixth, fifth century BCE, uh, who was a part of the Battle of Marathon. And uh, in uh, the biography by Cornelius Nepus uh, from, I think, the first century BC. Uh, it says about him that the first step in his public career came in connection with the war with Cor Corcyra, uh, chosen general by the people to carry on that contest. He inspired the Athenians with great courage, not only at that time, but also for the future. So the first uh, appearance of Themistocles is something that uh, that uh, tells the reader about his his future uh, courage uh, that he will show in later battles. So in that sense, it, it has some some programmatic uh, ring to it. Uh, this first uh, appearance. Another example is uh, uh, Plutarch's biography on Alcib Alcibiades. Uh, from the he's from the fifth century, also an Athenian statesman, uh, participating in the Pel Peloponnesian War, and uh, in his first appearance, uh, it appears by chance, uh, as far as I remember. There's uh, there are some people are collecting money for the state, and he appears unseen, and has also to get some money, but doing that, uh, the bird that is in his hands 
flies away and uh, they run around to to get to catch this quail and the one who catches it is the one who at the end uh, will be a a uh, the, the reason that Al alcibiades will lose uh, in in battle so uh, that it has also a programmatic note to it uh, his first appearance into public life, they say, was connected with a contribution of money to the state and was not of design. And then we hear about this uh, collection of money and uh, he, the, the quail that flies away. Thereupon the Athenians shouted all the more and many of them sprang to help him hunt the bird. The one who caught it and gave it back to him was Antiochus the sea captain who became in consequence a great for favorite with Alcibiades. So uh, that is uh, Alcibiades' uh, first public appearance, what I would call a programmatic scene. Two more examples, uh, Cato the Younger. Once again, we are with, uh, with uh, Plutarch and uh, Plutarch of course also has, has some programmatic statements in his uh, Proemia. So I'm not claiming that, that other scenes cannot have uh, be very important, other scenes at the beginning of a, a biography. But this, this uh, entry to the, on, this, on stage uh, seems to, to have a particular significance. I, I told you that I was not able to find a, an ancient word for it, but uh, actually there, there is a, in, as far as I understand, in, uh, in Italian opera, there is a, 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 a term, the sortita, uh, mean, meaning uh, the, the moment where the main character enters, uh, goes out on stage. But I guess I can't use that as, a, as an emic designation from Italian opera in relation to this context. But uh, Cato the Younger uh, uh, from first century uh, BCE, uh, um, senator and a great speaker, so of course his programmatic scene is a is uh, related to speech. This brought Cato for the first time and against his wishes into the forum. He opposed the tribunes and was admired for the proof of eloquence and high character which he gave, for his speech had nothing about it that was juvenile or affected, but was straightforward, full of matter and harsh. So he is... Uh, he is to the point from the very beginning. Uh, my final example, example is uh, from, from a, a novel, a biographic novel, uh, Pseudo Callisthenes. Uh, don't know how to date it. I don't know if anybody knows. Uh, but um, but uh, the, Alexander the Great, his uh, first appearance in public is when he asks his father Philip to to be allowed to go to Pisa to the Olympic Games uh, where he uh, wins a great chariot race. Uh, and that is, becomes a kind of omen uh, that shows what his future will be about. And the final word in that scene is, Alexander Olympian Zeus makes this prediction for you. Be of good cheer as you have defeated Nicolaus, so shall you defeat many in your wars. So the first, the first scene uh, is programmatic in the sense that it, it, it tells us what is going to happen with this main character uh, later on. So that was my, my uh, examples from uh, biographies uh, in, an, in antiquity. And uh, some features seem to, to come, come back again and again. Though, as I said, I cannot, uh, there's a, not, not a, there's not a, a number of stock devices that, that are always there in a programmatic scene. They can be short and long and so on. So it's uh, about conversion to public life, sometimes connected to end of predecessors public life. It's a bridge between the introduction and the main part. It's a kind of new beginning of the narrative. Uh, sometimes the main character arrives as, at a significant city uh, at this uh, scene. Uh, we always hear about public reaction and early success. That is, that is very common. Uh, and I would say also in Jesus' programmatic scenes, certainly. And then it, uh, the scene anticipates uh, later events. 
I may, I may be able to find other uh, motifs uh, to poi later on. But let's uh, now move uh, to the four uh, gospels. Uh, I, and I, what I want to do is to uh, to to show you uh, what scenes I regard as the programmatic scenes in the four gospels, and say a few words uh, about the the way they are programmatic. That is, of course, something that shall be uh, unfolded uh, much more. Uh, and after that, uh, also a few words about the reception, the early Christian reception of these scenes that I call programmatic scenes. Because that is something that I, I think could, uh, could strengthen my argument if early Christian readers of the Gospels would also apply special significance to those uh, scenes that I call programmatic scenes. Uh, Mark uh, is the earliest gospels, Gospel, of course. And uh, I would say that uh, everything before verse 21 in chapter 1 is prepar preparatory uh, uh, preparation to Jesus' actual um, activity. Um, first, in the first verses of chapter 1, we hear about John the Baptist as the forerunner with quotations from Isaiah, etc. And uh, then Jesus meets uh, John the Baptist in his ba baptism and uh, meets his first temptation. Uh, it's not the lost temptation of Christ in Mark. It's certainly uh, lots of temptations of Christ because we have it not only in, in, in 1, uh, 1, 12, uh, but also in with uh, Peter's temptation of Jesus in chapter 8 and uh, the temptation in Gethsemane uh, and also uh, the temptation at the cross when people want him to go down from the cross and save himself. So that is uh, certainly a, a general motif in, in Mark. Uh, but the baptism is, of course, his calling. And then there are uh, some preparation. I don't... Can you see my uh, cursor here, my... Yeah, okay, so I can use that. Uh, there is an important summary in 1.14 to 15, and then the calling of the first disciples. And all of that I would call the, the, the first preparatory phase of the story. And in tw 21 is the first time where, where we have a scene, a full scene where Jesus acts in public. Of course, one must not forget uh, 1.14 to 15. Uh, the summary where Jesus says, uh, the kingdom of God is near, repent and uh, believe in the gospel. Uh, that is, of course, a very important programmatic statement. But an actual programmatic scene is not uh, available until uh, Jesus' first exorcism, uh, the healing of the man with an unclean spirit in 1, 21 to 28. And that scene is, uh, as you can see in my headline here, uh, sorry, is the impending kingdom's first strike against Satan. So it becomes programmatic uh, in different ways. And I have tried to give you here some of the motives that certainly are general to the Gospel of Mark as a whole, in, so that this scene becomes a mini miniature of the Gospel. It, it is, of course, an illustration of the programmatic statement in 115 that the kingdom of God is near. How is it near? Uh, well, you can see that the demons and the powers of Satan are beginning to lose the battle. So, so in that sense, it is an illustration of the first statement of Jesus. It's, it shows for the first time Jesus as a successful uh, wonder worker. People are perplexed by his exousia, uh, his authority or power. Uh, by which he is able to combat uh, the, the evil powers in, in the world. This is, of course, based on, upon an apocalyptic worldview where, where God is the king of heaven and Satan is the king of the earth. And now the king of heaven is beginning to, to conquer new territory on earth. Um, it also uh, po points in the direction of Jesus' uh, halakha, uh, which is a theme in the following chapters, Jesus' interpretation of the, of the Torah, uh, and uh, gets him into conflict with established authorities. So it is 
the scene that sets the stage in relation to Jesus against Satan, Jesus against uh, religious authorities. And then there is a, a messianic secret motif, which, which is also, as you know, very important in Mark, since, uh, uh, since, uh, since Jesus asked the demon uh, not to say anything. So lots of mot motifs in this scene that, that will show to be core motifs of the whole Gospel of Mark. Yeah, this was brief, but uh, we're, we have to go through uh, uh, a, couple, a number of scenes. So I will now move on to Matthew. And uh, Ma uh, Matthew uh, seems to me to have uh, the Sermon on the Mount as the programmatic scene. Uh, that is quite late, uh, one might think. That is in chapter 5. That is, uh, well, if, if Mark had his programmatic scene already after 20 verses, this is, is way later. But still, I would say that everything that goes on before the Sermon on the Mount, that is Mark, uh, sorry, Matthew 1 to 4, is a prepar preparatory uh, actions. We hear about the genealogy of Jesus, his birth, and again the forerunner. We have the baptism and the temptation in the wilderness as before. And then uh, we have the calling of the first disciples. And we have a couple of summaries. Uh, I do grant that, that we have a couple of summaries here indicating uh, what Jesus did in public. But still, they are not actual scenes. They are summaries saying that Jesus was going into public action. The first actual public scene is the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5 to 7. So uh, it is also an important point for me to show that the four New Testament gospel authors were not satisfied, uh, or at least those after Mark, were not satisfied with just reproducing the Markan programmatic scene. They needed a programmatic scene that could be really programmatic to their gospel as a whole. And so just as with the Ultima Verba of Jesus, there is a severe redaction going on because, yeah, it seemed that the tradition was not satisfied with the mark and my God, my God, uh, why have you forsaken me? Um, so uh, Matthew turns the Sermon on the Mount into the programmatic scene. So the next question would, of course, be uh, what did Matthew do with Mark's programmatic scene then, if he knew it? And it is actually fascinating that he deletes it. Or rather, I would say he uh, rephrases it. He integrates it into the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, I would like to show you that, uh, show, show it to you here. On the left side, we have the Mark and programmatic scene with the healing of the, the man with the Anthropos in Pneumati Akathato with the unclean spirit. Uh, and do we have any of this material in Matthew? Yes, we do have that right before and right after the Sermon on the Mount, the last verses of chapter four and the last verses of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, the last, the summary here in, uh, in Matthew, in the last verses of chapter four, mentions how Jesus teaches in the synagogues, taken from the programmatic scene in Mark. It mentions that his, uh, the rumor about him was going out to the whole of Syria, uh, whereas Mark says the, the rumor was going out to the whole area of, of Galilee. It speaks about uh, Jesus healing the, uh, the demonized, uh, probably an equivalent to the man with the unclean spirit. And notice at the end of the Sermon on the, of the Mount, Matthew inserts a reaction that is ex exactly that reaction that we saw in the Mark and programmatic scene. Um, that they they are perplexed by his teachings. Uh, it seems as if Matthew have, have, have thought, well, Mark, yes, they were perplexed by his teachings, but we need to tell the reader who, what was his teachings. 
and then he puts Jesus' teachings uh, just before this reaction. So to illustrate in another way, here we have the Markan uh, programmatic scene, and Matthew has taken material from it, put it at the end of chapter four and at the end of chapter seven, so and put the Sermon of the Mount into the, uh, so to say, Mark and programmatic scene. So uh, that seems to me to be a, a, we never know, we should be careful about words like deliberate, but uh, it seems to be, it could be a deliberate uh, redaction of the Mark and programmatic scene. Matthew, has, to put it bluntly, Matthew have, has, simp has simply wanted a, another programmatic scene and has found a place for it exactly at the spot where Mark had his programmatic scene. Uh, programmatic most motifs in Matthew, uh, Jesus as the new Moses, uh, righteousness, uh, deeds before doctrine, divine judgment, imat imitatio dei. Uh, those are very important uh, motifs in the Sermon on the Mount and in the Gospel of Matthew as a whole. So in that sense, it is the most important speech uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, if I may say so. So let's let's move on to uh, Luke. Uh, in Luke, it's uh, uncontroversial. Uh, Four sixteen to thirty is the programmatic scene. People say so, but I think we could actually argue uh, in the same manner as with the other Gospels, saying that everything that goes on before. Uh, that scene in 416 to 30 is preparatory material. The annunciation and birth of Jesus and John the Baptist, the baptism, genealogy, and temptation in the wilderness, and then also a short summary uh, before we get the first full description of Jesus standing in public. And uh, again, we can ask, as we did with Matthew, what has Luke done to the Markan programmatic scene? And he has actually done something uh, quite similar, though he has not, uh, he has, he has not uh, integrated the, the, the text. He, he has kept the text of, of uh, Mark, but he has put it right after the, uh, the Lucan programmatic scene. So right after 416 to 30, we have the Markan programmatic scene with the healing of the, the man with the unclean spirit, which seems to me to be, again, the, uh, a, a very clear signal that the editor here is trying to move something in front of what was perceived as the Marx programmatic scene. Uh, once again, if we compare, um, here we have the verses right before the Lucan programmatic scene and the verses right after. Luke 4, 15, 14 to 15, and 4, 31 to 37. And again, in the, in the summary, Luke has taken, just as Matthew did, a wording from uh, the Mark and programmatic scene. But uh, unlike uh, Matthew, he has not uh, only taken some wording. After the programmatic scene in Nazareth, he has added the full and programmatic scene in 4.31 to 37. Um, and in addition to that, of course, uh, Luke has, uh, Luke has, um, Luke has uh, take, Luke's programmatic scene uh, from Nazareth is of course a scene from Mark 6 that he has moved in front and expanded. So uh, here in Luke, uh, once again, Mark, 121 to 28 is redacted and put uh, as a kind of uh, intercalation. We have uh, Jesus in the synagogue of Nazareth, which is a, an expanded version of Mark 6 to 1, 1 to 6. So in both Matthew and Luke, there seems to be alternative programmatic scenes and redaction of the Markan programmatic scene. Uh, the scene is put as a uh, as the bread in a sandwich around the, the beef of the programmatic scene. Now, uh, mot motifs in Luke, 
Jesus as loyal to Jewish institutions, prophecy and fulfillment, the spirit, good news to the poor, redemption and vindication, Gentile mission. All those motives are in the inaugural speech of Jesus in Nazareth and are important to Luke Acts as a whole. Moving on to John. In John, we do not have a redaction of Mark's programmatic scene, but still we have a, an introductory phase. Uh, we have the prologue, which is of course also in many ways programmatic, but not a, 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 a scene on stage. And we have uh, John the Baptist's testimony and the calling of the first disciples. So the first public appearance in John are those scenes we have in chapter two. And I would say that the first sign, the wedding in Cana almost uh, says it, uh, tells it uh, itself by saying that it is Arche Ton Simeon. It's the first of the signs. So it's the Arche, the first, but also the maybe the principle or the, the, the principle of all signs that we get in the wedding in Cana. So uh, when the wedding in Cana becomes the programmatic scene and then I, of course, have a problem with the temple incident because John has moved that scene from uh, the end of the story to the beginning of the story. And that uh, it's difficult for me not to interpret that as an attempt to make that scene programmatic. So my suggestion is that John is trying to, to create two programmatic scenes, a kind of programmatic diptych, uh, if, if I may, uh, the temple incident being uh, the programmatic scene in the Jerusalem context. And we have, of course, again, lots of programmatic motives in those two scenes. Uh, the hour, human versus divine will, signs, revelation of glory, belief, temple Christology, post-Easter hermeneutics, uh, important motives for, for the Gospel of John as a whole taken appearing for the first time in those two uh, scenes. Um, I would also say the end of chapter one in the Gospel of John, you shall see, see greater things, maybe a kind of uh, introduction to the programmatic scenes, uh, the wedding in Cana, and not only to the Gospel as a whole. Okay, I, I realize that this, uh, I'm, I'm moving fast, uh, but uh, you are New Testament people, so I hope you excuse these very uh, short remarks like I have on, on the on the hand uh, on the slide here. So um, the final part of my presentation here, and I guess that is uh, ten minutes, something like that. Um, the early reception of programmatic scenes. It is not something that I have had time to look very, very deep into. But I, I'm looking for uh, early Christian uh, readers of the Gospels, how they would interpret uh, these scenes that I have highlighted now, and whether they would at all discuss whether they have special significance to the ministry of Jesus as a whole. And uh, I have not found very much yet. I will just give you one quotation from uh, Origen, who is... Uh, as you know, uh, one of our best known early exegetes. And uh, here he discusses, uh, is Jesus' first appearance, is that in Capernaum or is it in Cana? Is it the, the, the Mark or John, we could say? And this also we have noticed about Capernaum that not only did he, the preaching, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, begin there, but that according to the three evangelists, Jesus performed there his first miracles. None of the three, however, added the first wonders which he recorded as done in Capernaum. That note attached, that note attached by John the disciple to the first work of Jesus. The, this beginning of his signs did Jesus in Cana of Galilee. For that which was done in Capernaum was not the beginning of the signs. Since the leading sign of the Son of God was good cheer, and in the light of human experience, it is also the most representative of him. For the word of God does not show forth his own beauty so much in healing the sick, as in his tendering the temperate draught to make glad those who are in good health and are able to join in the banquet. So here, 
as far as I understand the text, Origen is, has seen the dilemma. Uh, what was first Jesus' first uh, appearance? Uh, was it the healings in Capernaum, uh, healing in Capernaum, or was it the wedding in Cana? And he opts for the wedding in Cana. That is really the beginning of his signs. Um, this uh, reception of the programmatic scenes can, can may, 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 be, may be detected not only in what uh, early exegetes say about the text, but also in the manuscripts. And I have been trying to have a brief look at the manuscripts in terms of what we call uh, del del delimitation criticism, meaning looking at how does the manuscript, how do the manuscripts delimit the text? Because, of course, it would be very interesting to, to me if the ancient gospels manuscripts did something special with the those scenes that I call programmatic scenes. And to, to some extent, you, you can say so in the Kephalaya, that is the, the ancient chapters uh, that are in Codex Alexandrinus from the fifth century. So early readers of the gospels, uh, well, uh, we, it's not that early, but but it's it's the best some of the best we have. Uh, to the right, you can see the chapter division of the Gospel of Mark in Codex Alexandrinus, and the first ch chapter here is Peritu Daimonitomenu uh, on the demoniac. That is one twenty one to twenty three. So Mark Mark one is not at our mark one one, but it's at one twenty one or, or or twenty three. It seems that that this manuscript thinks that everything before the healing of the man with the unclean spirit is preparatory, is prologue, and we get into ac action in one twenty one or twenty three with the uh, demoniac. You can see that these uh, chapter headings are mostly named after the people that Jesus encounter, uh, Perites, uh, uh, Pentheras Petru, for example, the next one uh, on, the, on Peter's mother-in-law. So in Mark's case here, it's quite actually quite interesting uh, that this manuscript uh, has uh, the programmatic scene as the first scene and delimits it exactly as uh, I have done it uh, um, as programmatic scene. If we go to Matthew, uh, these are the Kephalaya in Matthew and uh, the Sermon on the Mount is not the first chapter in according to the Kephalaya, but it is a separate chapter. Uh, chapter five to seven is a, a, a single chapter in the Kephalaya called the Beatitudes. So it is seen as one single unit. That is at least interesting in the case of Matthew. In the case of Luke, uh, the Kephalaya are not, uh, do not uh, give, or they, they give other results because they do not, the, the scene 416 to 30 that, that has been called programmatic scene by New Testament scholars for many years, that is not a separate section in the Kephalaya in Luke. But uh, we can go back to the Codex Vaticanus, which has also a kind of uh, delimitation. And in Codex Vaticanus, Luke 4, 16 to 30 is marked beginning here and ending there. And you can see there, there's also a mark here, but there's not, nothing between 4, 16 and 4, 30. So it's seen as, as one, one unit. And if we go back to the Kephalaya in Codex Alexandrinus, uh, the case of the Gospel of John is also very interesting, I think, because here the first two chapters are the wedding in Cana and the temple incident. Peritu in Cana Gamu and Periton ek Blethenton ek tu Hiru. So here, once again, as, as in the Markan case, the manuscript seems to say that everything before the programmatic scene is preparatory. So according to this manuscript, the Jonah and prologue is not 1, 1 to 18, but it's the, what we call chapter 1 in John. 
Okay. So let me finish now. Um, the, the aim of, of this project is to demonstrate that the, the progr programmatic scene uh, was a common feature in uh, especially biographies and was used by New Testament uh, authors also, and that it served a particular function um, that is a programmatic function presenting the main character for the first time uh, more or less in full. Uh, I also want to identify and analyze the variety of programmatic scenes in the four New Testament Gospels, and if possible, also show how ancient Christian Gospel users in their exegetical practice and manuscript culture applied special significance to the programmatic scenes. Uh, I guess that's what I have to say uh, right now, and I look forward to response, questions, criticism, etc. Well, thank you so much, Casper. Uh, Many thanks indeed for your uh, performing your splendid programmatic scene here <laughs> on the stage here in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. um, uh, very fresh indeed, and uh, splendid to have an insight in your developing uh, project. So the floor will be open. And of course, we also call upon uh, the many classicists uh, that are present uh, to provide, if possible, a uh, terminolog terminological solution to uh, the newly founded genre of programmatic scenes. So you can raise your questions uh, by signaling them in chat so that they have a sense of, uh, of, of the order and chain of the discussions. And I see that, yeah, the first question uh, can, can, can be raised. Should I uh, turn off my sc share, uh, screen sharing? Uh, yeah, that would be uh, good. Yeah, then I have an overview uh, of the gallery. So if people keep an eye on, uh, on the chat, they will see uh, their plays in the order, uh, because in that case, I won't need to read out the names. Thank you. Then I guess I'm already there. Yeah, excellent. Oh, please, yeah, come forward. Uh, thank you very much. This was a fascinating presentation. And uh, I apologize, probably my, my, my question will not be central, but I wanted to ask it now because unfortunately we'll have to leave in a, in a moment. Uh, but so what I was wondering when you asked about, you know, the um, previous examples of uh, programmatic scenes, and I was wondering whether we could uh, introduce in the picture also epic poetry, the epic genre, and have a conversation specifically on uh, Iliad uh, 1. So the, 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 the very beginning of uh, Greek literature, because in a sense, I was thinking that there you have, um, in respect to the, to the main uh, hero of the poem, in a sense, you have twice the programmatic scene. And in the, in the first place, because you have the, 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 epic, um, the epic poem, so, uh, uh, from the, which does, um, so to speak, precisely what the author you mentioned at the beginning of the uh, of the paper expects the, the, the first page of, um, of a book to do. So it begins with uh, a very quick introduction on who is Achilles for, um, for the readers, for the listeners. And it begins actually with the word the menis, wrath, that is the, the main characterizing tra trait of uh, you know, Achilles' personality. But then mm. immediately afterwards, when the, 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 the book get, gets into you know, and, and action begins, what happens is that you have the meeting uh, of the, the Greek warriors, and uh, in this meeting, actually, Agamemnon and Achilles uh, talk to each other, and uh, Achilles' uh, entrance in the scene, I found it is particularly programmatic because uh, it's based on his pride, uh, on his wrath, so, and everything <coughs> he says marks the, the type of hero that he is. Thank you. Uh, wonderful question uh, and remark. Uh, I will uh, I will check certainly check that. And I also see now that uh, Professor Mona Hooker is here, which is uh, interesting because she wrote, uh, as you may know, most of you, a book on on beginnings in the Gospels. Uh, so so uh, she is an inspiration of mine. But uh, uh, Leah um, uh, Nikolai, um, it. I, I, I recognize uh, this 
problem from my reading in the Hebrew Bible, which is also, uh, which also contains uh, something that we could compare with epic. And uh, within epic or history writing, there may be some biographical sections where, where a, we follow a specific, specific person who then stands uh, on the public stage. And could that be called a programmatic scene? Um, maybe we, it could, but then it's not necessarily a scene that, that becomes a miniature of the whole work but only that characterizes that particular person uh, in general. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but, but I guess in, in the case of the Iliad, you, you might be right that it can uh, mm -hmm. characterize the whole work, uh, the question of, and, and the, the author that I mentioned who wanted the first word to have the full, the full of his uh, novels, well, uh, maybe uh, Homer was his inspiration. Uh, questions are flooding in, but I think uh, since uh, uh, Professor Mona Hooker was mentioned, I have her jump the queue. Thank you, George, and thank you for a fascinating paper. Um, I, I've got three points, if I may. Um, the first was why I wondered, why did you concentrate on the notion of biography? Um, the, the, the two Old Testament examples you gave, the first of, Sam, of Joshua, then of Samuel. Uh, Joshua, uh, you, you described as, as, as how they came into the promised land, and it seems to be much more a question of, of history, the history of Israel, Heilsgeschichte, to use the, the old fashioned word, mm -hmm. um, rather than of, a, of what we would call today biography. And the same really with Samuel, because although it concentrates much more on the figure of Samuel, um, Samuel is really um, the beginning of the establishment of, of the kingship of, uh, within Israel. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the first question. The second one, um, naturally I honed in on, on Mark in particular. And, and yes, the idea of exorcism is one idea in Mark. But I wonder whether it's really programmatic to the whole gospel. Uh, I mean, it's one theme, but, but we've already bypassed um, the theme of the kingdom of God, which you say is not a scene, but um, it, it's certainly a statement. The kingdom of God, which, which is what Jesus, is, Jesus sees his ministry is all about. We, we've bypassed the core of the disciples and and Mark has often been called the gospel about discipleship. And, and that's a theme that runs through the whole gospel. Mm -hmm. And most significantly, of course, of all, you bypass what I would call the prologue, uh, the first 13 verses, which tell us so importantly who Jesus is. And, and that's a theme which we really need if we're going to understand the, the rest of the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and then my third point really is, is a question as to how this is important. I mean, I mean you picked up on the fact that, that there may be um, signs later that people saw these passages as, 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 as certainly distinct. Hmm. But um, the Johannine sign, for example, the first two signs, they're, they're the first signs and they point forward to the theme of the whole gospel of course because all the signs point forward to the death of Jesus and so his glorification um, but to what extent would people reading the gospel or more significantly perhaps hearing the gospel have noticed these passages in particular what you're calling programmatic mm. um, would, would they have picked up and said oh I must keep this in mind this is what it's going to be all about or would their minds have already been filled with ideas in the in the in the, what you're calling the preliminaries, the preparation? And isn't that the more significant, especially in a, a community where things are being heard rather than read? You want to know what the book's going to be about mm. um, right from the very beginning. So mm. that the, the, the very first words are mm. surely the ones that are most programmatic. Mm. That's enough for me. 
Oh, uh, lots of uh, lots of uh, dimensions in in what you are saying there. Um, uh, I don't know uh, if I, I well. Um, one thing that you you point at is that, of course, there are motives that are important in the work as a whole that are not there in what I call the programmatic scene. And in the Markan case, that could be a di the discipleship uh, question. That, 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 that will have uh, to be something uh, to consider uh, in my study. Uh, uh, what important motives uh, from the work as a whole does this programmatic scene not contain? That is, of course, also something that I, I will have to look at in the, and of course, uh, the programmatic scene cannot contain everything just as the first words cannot contain everything. And it would be abs absurd to, to claim that in, for example, the Johannine case, that the, the, the Johannine prologue is not very programmatic and important. That's not, I don't want to, to diminish uh, the, the Lucan preface and the Johannine prologue, etc. But I, I want to, to point uh, to, to this new beginning uh, phase in the narrative, uh, which is, I think, as you also uh, imply a rhetorical device uh, that you need to have the most important messages from the very beginning uh, in a rhetorical culture. Um, can, can I come back on that? Would the authors then have deliberately known that they were doing this? Or, or is it something it, that just happens it, accidentally? It, 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 if, 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 if we can work in, in a pretty much a traditional redaction critical way with Matthew and Luke in relation to Mark, then I think it's quite obvious that they are both uh, looking at Mar the Mark and programmatic scene and saying, it's a good scene, but but can, can't we do something with it? Uh, yeah. Can't hear. You're muted, George. You're muted. <laughs> Thank you so much. I was indeed making an uh, attempt to regulate the discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, I read out the queue as it is, if people can raise their question as uh, concisely as possible. So the current list is Alan Brandt, David De Vaux, Anna Lefteratu, Simon Gerrigal, Nick Brett, John Proctor, Dagmar Winter, and Michelle Rugesi. So Alan Brandt uh, first. Yes, th th thanks very much for a, a, an interesting paper. One very significant point, it seems to me, that you made, uh, or for me at least, was, was on the Arche Semayan in, uh, in the Fourth Gospel, in the, the wedding of Cana of Galilee, in terms of that being, as it were, the, 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 the origin of, of the theme. One of the most profound papers in New Testament studies that I've I've ever ever read was written by Charlie Mole in connection with his brother's death, and, and he pointed out that what these signs were about were were not sort of spiritual allegories of um, Christ's ministry, but they were about what happens when human resources fail. And the most radical expression of the failing of human resources is, is the wine, the wine that fails at the wedding. And the signs go on to tell us what happens when sight fails, when uh, the ability to walk fails, when, um, when, um, when, when, you know, the man born blind or the raising of Lazarus uh, after after three days, that these were essentially about uh, what happens when human resources fail, and I was impressed in the way that Charlie saw um, the ap the absolute sort of model and paradigm of this in the 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 wedding, the the wine of Cana of Galilee. Thank you very much for for that comment. Uh... I think you're right that there are similarities uh, also between uh, the different gospels that, well, I, I don't know, is, is that significant that some gospels focus on a, a, a healing action as the first public programmatic action and others on discourse? I 
I guess that's a rhetorical question that we uh, bear in mind. So we go on to David DeVore. So um, I want to thank you very much, Dr. Larson, for this very stimulating talk. I think I wrote down about a dozen questions as I went through, um, but and, and I'm not even a New Testament scholar. Um, but it seems to me that uh, I, I, just picking up on uh, um, Professor Hooker's question, um, it seems to me that what is um, going on here, given the example that uh, Professor Nikolai uh, offered of the Iliad, that we don't really have so much a literary genre topos here, um, as we have a common public experience, a common experience in the Greco-Roman world of the first um, appearance of a figure coming out into the public uh, into the public eye um, in a society that um, was very anxious about um, one's public persona um, and, and uh, took, took seriously the preparation for public life where public life was uh, so much the, basically dominated one's perception of the self. Um, and I don't think that we necessarily need to look for a uh, genre topos for this. Um, or a specific word. I mean, we see the we see RK, we see Primos, we see Protos as uh, uh, marking some of these particular scenes. But it would seem to me that this would be an event that would go beyond biography, um, and one that would appear in the Iliad or the Odyssey. Also comes to mind, where in, in Book Five, and it's not coincidence that the Odyssey delays it into Book Five, um, where Odysseus, um, his first appearance in public, is washed up onto an island naked in front of a, a woman, uh, um, uh, Nausicaa, famously. Um, and uh, I, I can I can think of a number of episodes where the for the protagonist, not necessarily the biographical subject, appears in public. Um, so it seems that the the public um, setting of the scene is what characterizes this, rather than just specifically a uh, topos in genre, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. So the biogra the biographical component of this isn't necessarily a genre. But what um, Robert, what Alistair Fowler, the the biographer, the genre theorist, might call a mode that would be incorporated into many different kinds of genres and be activated at different moments, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So that's that's my comment. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, that's of course imp an important question whether this should should in fact be widened uh, and not be some be be branded as something that is peculiar to biography. Uh, that maybe it's simply based on social reality, uh, and uh, some genres. Uh, well, there there are of course interesting connections between social reality and genres. Some genres uh, live and die, and uh, because of the the social milieu that that uh, that uh, animates them, uh, in which they can live. Um, and maybe this this move into the public sphere is is particularly. Yeah, well, uh, you saw my picture of Amanda Gorman. So you, of course, we also have this uh, today, uh, yeah. but it's also uh, quite significant that it's difficult to find female uh, programmatic scenes because the public space is mainly uh, male. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Anna Lestratu. Many thanks for this. Excellent and very inspiring talk. I want to link with exactly what you said right now, like that we don't have women on the public space, we do. So you mentioned also the novels and Bassan when you started your, uh, your talk. And the issue is that there we have women. We have women which are objectified and women which are coming in the public space. And if there is a kind of uh, programmatic or literary term to explain what is beginning, what's an end in a Greek novel, which is about women and about highly objectified ekphrastic described women in public is exactly the word archi that you also used in John. So in the Greek novels, and especially in Carito and uh, Xenophon of Ephesus and later Heliodorus, where you have this massive open scene, which is exactly the way you said the first 10 lines is exactly the novel. I mean, in Heliodorus, the first 10 lines of the novel is the novel. And the same also goes for Carito. Then what you have there is like, it's full of adjectives, like first this happened, then she came, or then the other thing you had in John was, uh, no, I think it was in Matthew, it was about fame. The notion about fame, how a narrative goes from a person to person, or what, some, how something becomes popular, this is exactly how the narrative moves from the mouth to the page, to some extent. 
what I find very different from the Greek novels when you are when it's the discussion about uh, the life of Jesus and like the life of other Thaumaturgs, like a philosopher whose life of Apollonius that also starts with a miracle. We have something on his childhood, and then okay, he got, went out there and he started exercising people and demons. Is that you do not have these ekphrastic beginnings that you have in um, in the Greek novels or in the Latin novels, and this is a very different, a massive difference from the Greek and Roman way of appreciating the narrative. So this is was just a main comment, and my comment on Pluto, I guess, will be asked by Michele Lucchesi, following up here. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, there is the programmatic of uh, he and Telos in Xenophon, uh, in Carrie, than in all the novels. Okay. W as a way of structuring uh, programmatic scenes. Did you, did you write on that, or can you refer me to some? I can I can put some stuff here now on the um, on the chat box for later. Yes. So George, don't close down uh, the chat before I have copy pasted. Uh, it, uh, it will be recorded, including uh, those uh, those remarks. So that's splendid. I think uh, Simon Gedegor is next. Yeah, thanks. I was going to ask a question actually. Um, it was it was about the. Um, the question of delay, uh, Dave, David mentioned the delay of um, Odysseus's appearance in the Odyssey, and I wondered, I wondered to what extent you thought that there was a sort of slightly delayed um, uh, presentation of Jesus in, in any of the Gospels, um, in, with, the, with some of those programmatic scenes, for example, in Luke 4, you know, quite, after quite a lot of preamble, um, even in John, there's, there's quite a lot of stuff happening before, before the programmatic um appearance uh, on, on you i also just the, the sort of going back to the point that Morna made as well i just wondered about the baptism as well because the baptism is is you know in matthew and mark the bat the baptism is the first public appearance of jesus and it's it sort of has a programmatic character doesn't it in the, in that it you know it's where you, where jesus is identified as the son of god um the spirit descends and there's a sense of his you know like a like a kind of prophetic commission or call um in which um he's identified for the for for the public audience it's a, you know it's his perfect his first public appearance and that's where you're sort of you're first oriented i suppose towards you know the public perception of jesus uh, in the baptism in in mark yeah yeah I think I, I understand the, the fact that that uh, the words from heaven are, are formulated in the second person, that, that it's not very public mm -hmm. uh, compared to Matthew, where it's uh, hutos and not su. Sure, uh, yeah. Yeah, but, but of course, uh, yeah, uh, it's... Uh, all, all those scenes point in towards later fulfillment in, in some sense. Uh, I can see that. But uh, an important point that you point out is is this with the delayed arrival. Uh, is there some maybe some suspense? Uh, I know from from the Greek tragedies there are sometimes delayed departures, uh, where where the the some of the characters on stage they talk about leaving stage, but they don't do until uh, uh, ten minutes later or whatever. So uh, that has been compared to Jesus' departure in his uh, farewell scene in, in the Gospel of John. Uh, people have uh, noticed that he says, let's move away from here. And then two chapters later, he's still talking. So, so delayed departures, delayed arrivals, is that a motif that we can find in, in other kinds of literature? Uh, the the uh, the uh, the Iliad was mentioned, and that is certainly a story about delayed arrival. Uh, we're just waiting and waiting for this guy to to go into action. Um, yeah. Thank but you. Thanks very much. I really really enjoyed the paper. Thanks a lot. Uh, next is Nick Brett. Can you unmute yourself, Nick? You are still on mute. Okay, shall I start again? Um, it seems to me that the, the passage 16 to 30 is a later insertion. 
because if you go from um, sort of verses 14 to 15 and you go to 31, that seems to continue that he was praised in one in Galilee and then he went to Capernaum. Put in this, put in, in the, the, the passage here, uh, reminds me of um, the book by Marion Palmer Bonds, who wrote about the pastor's legacy, who, and she postulated that Luke Acts is in fact, uh, the overarching theory is, or the idea is based on the Aeneid, where uh, Aeneas left uh, Troy and then went to found Rome and the Christian religion is going to go to Rome as well. That's the overarching theory. And it's quite interesting because um, halfway through this passage, he's read in the, in the synagogue in Nazareth, and then he starts antagonizing um, the, uh, the people in the synagogue. And they start to go and kill him. And they, give him they, they drive him to a cliff, and then he walks through them and goes down to Capernaum. If you look at the fact that he was actually the Holy Spirit in the name of the Father had landed on him earlier, that's a symbolism of Aeneas taking his father through the crowds, through the destruction of um, uh, Troy, to go to the sea, to go on his on his on his boat to to found Rome by a Carthage. So it does seem that he's he's put in. You know, this could be an even bigger, you know, an even more emphatic start to his ministry. If if it's um, if we're saying that you know this this analogy to the Aeneid uh, has some basis. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, there's 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 been quite an interest in in that uh, Mimas's criticism, uh, as 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 I know it, uh, the Gospels as as imitations of uh, the Homeric works. Um, I don't know what to say about it. I, I, I'm convinced that that the Gospels are, in their content, very Jewish, but in their form, very Greco-Roman, uh, if we can put it that, such a sharp distinction. But but uh, but it's it's difficult to show that that the Gospels have been are, are trying to deliberately uh, reproduce uh, codes from from the. I, the, I, I, yeah, I don't think I, I don't you can I don't think you can do it a one-to-one -one correspondence, mm. but I think in parts of it it, it yeah. strikes you like there's there's definitely an echo of Plutarch mm. um, uh, in, in Acts, mm. and it just it's if you're not if you're looking for it, but it, it can strike you when uh, you don't think it's there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think on a, on a generic not, level it makes sense, but not necessarily on a, a idiomatic level. Uh, well, many thanks, Casper. Uh, so we are moving forward with uh, John Proctor. Uh, thank you very much for a, a very interesting paper, Dr. Larson. Um, I'd like to ask a question about the Book of Acts. I think uh, a good case can be made that um, Pentecost is a programmatic scene in Acts, and uh, that would suggest that the Ascension is part of the preparatory material. Um, that Acts is, is not a biography in the way that the Gospels are. Um, does, that, um, does that help your theory or, or does it introduce a, an unwelcome complication? Mm -hmm. uh, it, I would say something in between. It's a welcome complication. Um, yes, I, I'm, I'm also uh, used to thinking of uh, of Pentecost as the programmatic scene in, in Acts. Um, it's where the, the disciples go public um, um, and a kind of correspondence to uh, the, the baptism of Jesus in, uh, in, in Luke. Uh, so if, if we read Luke Acts as one work, then the main character is not Jesus uh, or the disciple, it's, it's the spirit that travels. Uh, um, but but I think your your question plays into that general question whether this this uh, programmatic uh, feature should be uh, seen as something more general than than appearing in biographies, and maybe maybe uh, that's the direction I have to move uh, in relation to the conversation today. Uh, Thank you very much. Yeah. Doug Winter. 
Hello, thank you for the uh, paper, Kasper. Um, I have a, a, a little question about the, I was thinking about the interaction between the rhetorical device of, of the programmatic scene and, and, the, and the theology and wondered how one might be shedding light on the other. And I was thinking about that, particularly in conjunction with Mark's gospel where, where there's this separation between the programmatic scene and, and the summary of, of Jesus' message in verse 15. And that of course has to happen because of uh, Mark's uh, theology of the disciples not getting it. Uh, and so it, we get this kind of like a sneak preview or, um, in, in verse 15 of what really this is, this is all, all about, or perhaps with the whole, with the whole f first few verses. So mm. how does this shed light on, on the theology? Mm. Is, is that a, a useful tool that you're looking further into? Yes, that, that is uh, one of my, uh, the aims in my interpretation is to do these uh, generic uh, studies to, to be able to be more precise in relation to the content of the text. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and the very fact that, that the four gospels have different programmatic scenes points in the direction that they also have different theologies. And so uh, that that would be something to to go into, of course. Uh, um, yeah, I, I don't want to be more specific uh, right now. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, Michel Lucchesi. Hello, and uh, well, thank you very much indeed for your wonderful paper. Um, my question is about, uh, well, possibly biography, but not, well, not so much about biography uh, alone. Um, uh, you made a very good point about pro programmatic scenes, and uh, uh, um, I like the way in which you related them uh, to uh, the entrance into public life. In ancient biographies, uh, uh, these scenes uh, are often programmatic in the sense that they um, uh, present certain uh, 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 traits of the character in action and they show us how uh, the protagonist um, uh, collaborates or uh, challenges uh, uh, the public. It could be the city, it could be uh, the army, um, uh, so one versus the many. And, uh, and we see certain traits that then uh, develop in the rest of the biography in the sense that sometimes these traits are confirmed by the rest of the narrative or they are challenged. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, they are disproved, uh, questioned. So I wonder whether uh, it happens, uh, so the same happens in, in uh, uh, in the Gospels, or whether that could be a key how to look further into programmatic scenes as uh, uh, opposed to the development of, uh, of the Gospels, and whether that might, might also be a theological point in the sense that certain uh, aspects, uh, certain theolo theological aspects that, that you may see quite early in the Gospels are, are, are later developed or disproved or challenged or put into question. Mm, yeah, yeah, I, I, I certainly see that uh, it, it, the, the, the programmatic scenes do not give the whole story away, uh, but they, they present uh, themes. And if we take the Markan example, so we have the identity of Jesus, which is very important in Mark. Uh, sometimes we call it the the, the messianic secret, uh, and uh, I like to talk about the double messianic secret in, in Mark. That is, there are two questions related to the identity of Jesus. First, uh, is Jesus Messiah? And second, how is he Messiah? And uh, the second question is maybe more important than the first one. So what happens in the programmatic scene in Mark is that that it is uh, being revealed uh, the first part of the messianic secret that Jesus is the Messiah or, or the, the Holy One of God. But the second part of it, uh, you need to read, uh, get, uh, you need to arrive at chapter 8, 9, and 10 to begin to understand the, the, the depths of the messianic secret. 
So just to take Mark as an example, it's it's clear that that it doesn't reveal every any everything from the beginning, but but opens a theme that will be deepened throughout the text. As my clear uh, um, uh, criterion. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm afraid, Casper, you will be making a uh, delayed departure. Uh, people have been so disciplined, but there are two questions left. And I think people have been so disciplined that it would be good to allow the last two questions. So if people need to leave, of course, that is entirely understandable. So uh, the penultimate question is anonymous. Uh, I'm reading out one of the two questions that were posed. Uh, one of them says, in Matthew and Luke, um, isn't the baptism of Jesus the first public event? Um, I, I, I actually don't remember if there are text signals that tell, tell us that this happens in public. Uh, I, I'm not sure that there is, so I think you could argue both ways. And then I would say that, well, if we can argue in both ways, then uh, this is still preparatory since it's a, it's a kind of call narrative that prepares the, the main character for his mission. But the mission, actual mission, has not gone, gone into practice yet. Thank you for a concise answer. And the last uh, question is for Tom Habib. Uh, thank you. Um, I think this was actually asked in part before, but um, I noticed that um, when you talk Thank you so much for the paper. I noticed when you talked about um, what to draw from these pro programmatic scenes, you spoke mostly about motifs uh, that we can see going throughout the gospel. I was interested if you've looked into how um, the moral character of the subject is portrayed in the programmatic scenes as well, just given the emphasis in biography on moral character and moral evaluation, um, whether this is something that you consider as you look at these programmatic scenes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, th I think uh, the, the, the scenes function to present the ethos of the main character. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure they do uh, also do that. Uh, for example, uh, yeah, I would say that uh, for, uh, in John, uh, the wedding in Cana, uh, on in chapter one, it seems that that John is trying to go with uh, the Presbyterian Crichton argument that the older the better, so Jesus has to be old. Jesus is older than the Baptist, he's even as old as creation, he's the Logos. But then in John 2, he tries another, another um, strategy of presenting Jesus' ethos as, as a newcomer and, and with the freshness of the newcomer. Uh, who comes with, uh, he gives even better wine than the old wine. So, uh, and who uh, reforms the temple. So two strategies seem to be, uh, be in play in John 1 and John 2 regarding his ethos. So just as one example. Well, thanks so much, Casper. Uh, uh, I think we never had so many questions in such a short uh, uh, time. So that really indicates uh, the interest that you uh, generated. So thank you so much. Uh, and I, I guess when you want to uh, contribute to your research, we might consider buying uh, our beer from uh, your brewery that is sponsoring uh, your research as a, a arche for your research that is turning beer into research. It sounds uh, rather Johannine, doesn't it? Yeah. So, uh, well, thank you so much for all Cheers. those uh, 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 present. And uh, in a fortnight, we have the second seminar on uh, the Gospel of Mark as a ancient biography by Helen Bond. So you're most welcome to attend. Look forward to that. She's excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful meeting you.